I am Vanessa Potkin, a senior staff attorney at the Innocence Project. We asked for people to submit questions on Facebook and we got an overwhelming response and today I'm here to answer as many of those questions as possible. Nicole Leville Clark asks, what was your career path background and how did it lead you to the Innocence Project? I um, did a lot of internships and work while I was an undergraduate in the criminal justice system. I worked for a foster care program um, advocating for children who were in foster care. I uh, also, after graduating from college, spent a year working for an alternative to incarceration program here in the Bronx. And um, during that time really was exposed to uh, the inequities that exist in the criminal justice system. And while I was in law school, I met uh, Peter Newfeld and Barry Sheck, the co-founders and co-directors of the Innocence Project. When I was studying for my bar exam, I got a call from Barry and he said, you know, hey, we got money to hire our, a staff attorney at the Innocence Project. And um, from that point, you know, a few weeks later, I came to the Innocence Project and I joined the team as, as the first staff attorney here. Jill Anderson asks, what advice would you have for new attorneys wanting to become involved with the Innocence Projects or other like-minded organizations? And Connie Schmidt asks, how can non-attorneys get involved? What qualifications are necessary? Uh, if you want to get involved with Innocence work anywhere throughout the country, you know, start um, working in criminal justice, get exposed to the issues in any way possible. Start doing internships. Contact a, an Innocence Project in your area and see if you can come on board as a volunteer. In terms of, you know, who can be a part of the Innocence Movement, anybody. We're not just a legal office. We also do communications work to get out the word about wrongful convictions. We have a policy department that's working to try to enact laws and um, you know, bring about reforms to prevent wrongful convictions and and we also have a whole intake department where people are screening the requests that we get here to determine whose case we can take on. So we're not just a group of lawyers, you know, we are an organization that draws upon so many fields and skill sets that um, it, it's really a movement that is all inclusive. Several of you asked, why does the Innocence Project focus on DNA cases only? We focus on only DNA cases because we're a national project. We're based out of New York, but we take cases from anywhere throughout the country. And to do a non-DNA investigation really requires on-the-ground work that we're not uh, best situated for here in New York. We decided to limit the cases that we take on to DNA cases so that we can best serve the people who are writing into us and seeking our assistance and also so that we can have cases where we have irrefutable scientific proof of innocence that reveal a host of issues in the criminal justice system that we can then use to implement reform. May C. Vang asks, if no DNA is involved, how can one try to prove their innocence? There are many ways other than DNA to prove innocence. It is difficult, but uh, there's a host of other types of evidence that can establish that somebody was wrongfully convicted. Sometimes this involves finding alibis that were never presented at trial. Sometimes it involves evidence that somebody else committed the crime. We've had cases where the true perpetrator admits that he was the person who did the crime, not the person wrongfully convicted, and this is able to be corroborated through other evidence. Um, there are other types of uh, quote-unquote sciences that were used to convict a person, um, arson evidence, and changes within that field have been able to establish that somebody was wrongfully convicted. So there, thankfully, are a host of ways to prove innocence, and it's very uh, key that they be pursued because 
DNA really is involved in so few of criminal cases and convictions. And we know that the mistakes that lead to wrongful convictions in the DNA cases exist in other types of cases. There's no reason to think the problems with identifications or confessions or these um, invalidated sciences only exist in the DNA cases. Of course, they exist where there's no biological evidence. So it's, it's critical that we have people out there working to prove the innocence of people who were wrongfully convicted in a case where there's no DNA. Dara um, Nob asks, what is the one thing law enforcement could do to diminish getting the wrong guy in a crime? There's a lot of work that we are doing in terms of enacting reforms, but I think if there was one particular change that I could make to the criminal justice system to prevent wrongful convictions, it would be addressing tunnel vision on the part of police and prosecutors because all too often, once somebody is arrested, uh, police really focus on building the case. It's about what evidence can we use to corroborate guilt. And in doing so, uh, evidence that tends to exonerate the person is excluded, or even pointing to a different suspect is just kind of filtered out and diminished. And that's a big problem, because in a lot of our cases we see that there was evidence that this person was innocent at the beginning. There was evidence that somebody else did the crime and that was just overlooked because of tunnel vision. And, um, you know, really to make it a shared responsibility among everybody in the justice system to not just make an arrest, to not just, you know, take that arrest and turn it into a conviction, but to make sure we're getting to the truth we're identifying the actual perpetrator. Rena Rodriguez and others asked, how can we get more attention on shaken baby syndrome cases? This is really important. There are a lot of people nationwide who have been convicted based on shaken baby syndrome. And in some of these cases, uh, the convictions were based on bad science, uh, based on evidence, for example, that the injury scene could have only happened through shaking when in reality we've learned that those type of same injuries can happen through a completely accidental short fall. So you know these cases are especially tragic. We're dealing with the loss of children. A lot of times their caregivers, could be their parents, are the ones who are charged for these crimes and convicted. Overall it's really critical that we make sure that uh, evidence that's coming into courtrooms under the guise of science really has a scientific basis and this is true for shaken baby cases but also for a variety of sciences that are being presented in courtrooms. Patricia Ledford asks, what can be done to make prosecutors and police more accountable for their actions? One of the problems that we encounter is that there are great immunities afforded to police and prosecutors. And a lot of times after a wrongful conviction happens, it's you know swept under the rug as an, a mistake. And we see that oftentimes, um, in most of our cases, there is some type of conduct that, misconduct that has led to the wrongful conviction. And it's very important that police and prosecutors are held accountable and defense attorneys who do a poor job, and we see that as well, by professional associations. If there's criminal conduct, there should be criminal charges. In civil lawsuits, they should not be financially immune because in order for people to act differently, they have to be held accountable. And we know this, this is the entire premise of our entire criminal justice system. So we have to have the same rules apply to the actors that are helping to carry out the system. Cindy Brown asks, what rules of evidence or procedure would you like to see changed? Right now, we have um, rules in courts that are just not in line with the science and what we know about the types of evidence that are being used to convict people. So for example, there's a test that's used throughout the nation to evaluate whether an eyewitness identification is the result of suggestion, and if there was some type of suggestion in the case, can it still nonetheless be admitted into court? And unfortunately, right now what we're seeing is that the test that's being used is out of line with the 30 years of social science about that we know about identifications and 
misidentifications and the factors that affect reliability. Recently, there was a, a great decision out of the Supreme Court in New Jersey, um, the Henderson case, that basically tackled this exact issue and said that basically there needs to be some type of reliability hearing when there's suggestion and that the factors that will evaluate the the reliability of an identification you know must be in line with what we have learned from the social science so we need to see these type of procedures changing throughout the country and Thanks so much for submitting questions. I hope this was helpful. If you have further questions, please reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube.